Welcome everyone to today's Observability Clinic Open Telemetry for Rust developers, not Rusty developers, Rust developers. <laughs> Interesting and analyzing your data with Dynatrace. Today, I have Stefan Baumgartner. Hi, Stefan, how are you? Hi, I'm doing good, how are you? Good, good. I think you have one of the most uh, hilarious uh, <laughs> pictures, uh, which I'm very happy to, uh, to, to have yes, here. So they said, um, look funny. So that's what I did. And, and yeah. I like this picture much, much more than the serious one, because we got a serious one and not yeah. a serious one. I love that one. That's why I'm using it yeah. uh, all the time. So Stefan, the reason why you're here today, a couple of weeks ago, I bumped into you in our office and I know that you are a public speaker and I think you're talking about Rust as well at different meetups and conferences. Okay. And then I said, hey, Stefan, could you do me a favor? Can you show me how a Rust developer would instrument an app using open telemetry and then interesting and analyzing it with Dynatrace? And this was kind of the task that I gave you. Mm -hmm. You said, sure, I'm doing it. And Stefan, now I want to actually hand it over to you and show us what you've prepared. And I'm sure I have one or two questions. And yeah. later on, if people have questions that are watching this offline, I'm sure they can obviously connect to us, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on LinkedIn or wherever we are. But Stefan, go All ahead. Right, cool. Thank you very much. So, so yeah, exactly what we are going to look at today is, is um, like making the case for Rust. Rust is a very new and exciting programming language and it's, it's taken the cloud native world by storm, so to speak. So you see lots and lots of projects written in Rust and there's a very good use case for writing your applications, your microservices, your infrastructure software um, in Rust. Um, and um, since it's, it's brand new and, and I mean, it's around for 10 years, but it really took off in the last couple of years now. Um, it, it's always hard for a company like us to, to catch up on new technologies. Uh, which is why it's great that something like open telemetry exists where we can rely on a protocol to attach basically any technology and any upcoming technology to Dynatrace. And this is what I wanted to show you in a, yeah, in a, in a rough hello world, hotel hello world, uh, you, you're going to find out that um, the Rust open tele telemetry hello world is around 200 lines of codes, which is a lot. Um, and it relies on a lot of abstractions, but this is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, First, that you understand why it needs all those abstractions, why it needs that, that amount of boilerplate code um, and what benefit you get out of it. So I think that's, that's equally important. Perfect. The application that you're looking at is, 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 is pretty, pretty straightforward. So you have Dyna, the Dynatrace cluster on, on one side, and I guess you've seen that uh, uh, plenty of times um, um, in, in the past, uh, where we want to use the uh, Open Telemetry Pipeline or Trace Interest API to, to send traces from a simple Rust server um, um, to the Dynatrix cluster. So this is an HTTP server. Uh, I built in on, on the Exum framework. Exum is a, um, a Rust framework where you can just have um, routes and map it to, uh, to functions. And you execute the function, you get the response for that. And Exum itself is made by the Tokyo team. And, and if, you, if you are taking Rust seriously, and if you want to work in, in cloud native or in web or in any network application whatsoever, you are going to stumble upon Tokyo because Tokyo is the de facto standard for asynchronous and network applications in Rust. Mm -hmm. It provides you with an asynchronous runtime. If you know something like, like Go or, or, or Node.js, they come with an asynchronous runtime for executing tasks asynchronously. Uh, in Rust, you have to add your own. And this is why things like Tokyo emerge, which provide you with that basic set of features uh, and take, take off the responsibility for you. Um, this is due to Rust trying to keep all options open. So there are a couple of third-party libraries that just work like they are part of the, of the native ecosystem within Rust. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Tokyo team has not only this asynchronous runtime, but it also has a very complete and correct implementation of HTTP in Hyper. And for that, it has a middleware system. So you are able to collect different layers of middleware for, for HTTP to modify your requests and response and execute something in the end. And this is the foundation for Exum, this one framework that lets you map a route to a function. So lots of abstractions here to execute the simple task down there. Um, but what you should, should get from all that, what I'm saying here, um, is that we need all those abstractions because we are working with a programming language that compiles down to native code. No virtual machine, no, no runtime. So the runtime that I've added is, is one runtime that I added by choice, not one that is provided by the programming language. The programming language comes without a runtime, which also means that I have no garbage collection. So instead of 
having garbage collection like in basically any programming language, um, I get zero overhead from that because um, there is no garbage collection. What it does instead is having guaranteed memory safety through a, a very new and interesting ownership and borrowing model. Um, this is this would take hours to describe what this is doing, but but please, if you're interested in Rust and ownership and borrowing, send me a tweet, send me an email. Um, uh, I'm happy to answer everything that you want to know. The only thing that's important for you right now is imagine you're writing your software in C++, but you can make sure that you get no memory corruptions whatsoever. This is this is the promise that Rust gives you. Alrighty, so that's what we're looking at, and I'm directly jumping into um, here we are into into my Visual Studio Code window. I hope the screen is okay. Um, one question that I get asked every time is, "What's the great theme?" That's Dracula. Uh, check it out. It's my most favorite theme. It's pink and and neon and lovely and uh, and actually very nice readable. Um, this is the cargo tumble file, which where I list all my dependencies. So I, I said I need to rely on a lot of dependencies, a lot of third party code. I got the server. I got Tower for services. I'm going to talk about that just in a second. I got Tokyo um, as the runtime, uh, something to parse JSON files, serializing, deserializing, and the ton of open telemetry packages as well. So um, this is stuff that I copy pasted all from, um, uh, from uh, the Dynatrace. Uh, um, tutorial on how to add Rust uh, to open telemetry. There's one tutorial out there which basically describes everything that I need to do, which is copy pasting a couple of functions and pressing start at one point, which was nice. Um, and it worked out pretty well, I have to say. So, so this, um, um, we're going to send a link afterwards. Um, this is, um, this is like you want to have a documentation, have a couple of steps, copy paste code, and see everything works. So this was really, really nice. For me. And here I have the main Rust file, and this is already a lot. So this is this is the hello world. Thump. You you could play elevator music and watch me scrolling down the hello world if you like. Um, this is the main function. I guess this is the one thing that's that's good to start it because hey, it's it's the main entry point. I start the the trace. I'm going to uh, show you what this does in just a second. Uh, and this is everything that I need to do. I just need to start the tracer. This is a function that I've written. This is the one function that I copied from the docs. Then I'm creating a router. This is where I'm going to map every route to, let's say, a get uh, method, which executes the root function. Or I have a route that does post users and expect some sort of payload and stuff like that. This is how I create my routing table. I have a layer for tracing chest. What this does, I'm going to tell you in a second. Uh, and then I'm opening an address. And, and listening to that address, there we are. Um, they are binding the server to that address and starting it. That's everything that I do. Mm -hmm. um, the init tracer function, this is, this is the one stuff that I copied from the box. And what I do here is uh, I use lots of functions from, from uh, open telemetry. So this is global from open telemetry mod global, where I'm setting a couple of legs. I'm, I'm starting a new pipeline with, with an exporter, an OTLP exporter. Um, that um, goes to my Dynatrace endpoint. So this here is uh, my tenant ID. Uh, and I got them um, from the docs, I got uh, an HTTP API, a post API mm -hmm. um, that's exposed that I just can, can address. So, so I need to do nothing more. Um, and I also need my API token. So this is one API token that I get from, uh, from the API token menu within Dynatrace, create the new one, select open telemetry interest. That's everything that I need to do. I copied the function, I imported all the stuff that I needed. I uh, changed line 65, I changed line 80, a um, little bit of trace counting, that's it. So this is the initialization. Uh, and the other function that I copied, this is the read RT metadata. Um, uh, I, don't know, I don't even know what it does. Uh, uh, it's, it's called somewhere, that's good for me. It's one resource that it needs to make all the inches that I, that I sent Dynatrace. So, so it works well with, with our tool. Um, that is that. Um, so, so now uh, open telemetry is, is all set up, which is good. So, so I have, um, I have uh, uh, set up the, the exporter, I've set up the pipeline, set a couple of legs that I needed to do. Um, those are things um, um, that the service name and the version, this is something that I can, uh, that I can set on my own so I know uh, which apps to, to see afterwards. Um, all right, so 
this, this is great. This is the setup, but it doesn't give me any, um, any, any traces yet. So I would have to create my own traces and spans. Um, and for that, I'm using the actual open telemetry API. Um, one thing that is great if you are in the entire Tokyo Exum and, and Tower ecosystem is that um, basically everything that sits on top of Hyper, the one thing that handles HTTP requests, is based on so-called services. Um, a service is nothing but a layer that accepts a response, in, uh, a request, an incoming request, does something with the data, and sends out the response. Um, and you can layer them on top of each other, which is the tower of layers or the tower of services where your request comes from the top all the way down and back all the way up. And every step does a transformation. So if I'm getting an HTTP request, this is just a plain HTTP request and I'm only reading out HTTP data, like what is the URL, what is the, uh, the method, etc. And based on that, I'm selecting one of my uh, um, uh, route services. So every, every function that I add here is also a service, but this is a service that handles the get request for this path. And Tower is directing me to that one. Um, and since uh, um, this is this is a, here we are, this is a very easy function. So it's, it takes no arguments and it spits out a static string. Um, this HTML wrapper here just sets the right headers and stuff like that. Um, but this get request is also being transformed to be compatible with this function because it has a, 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 a strong typing system. It needs to make sure that this method signature here is compatible with the HTTP request that comes in. So this is, this is um, also something that basically Rust does, does on its own for me. I can have very strict typing and based on those typing and a lot of generic foo, uh, Tower is making this function compatible with the service that had an HTTP call beforehand. Um, I can even uh, add, for example, request um, request um, body to it. it. It would still work, but then I have access to the actual request, uh, uh, the actual HTTP request. I can say something like, um, yeah, headers dot, um, no, it's not on headers. Um, I always get it wrong. It's rec uri path. Okay, rec uri um, dot path. And I could, for example, print it on, on, on standard out or any logging service that you like. Or, or, well, maybe maybe send, uh, send uh, that will work. Ah, I'm a newbie, sorry. <laughs> uh, or maybe send an interest. This is what I'm doing at another place. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing is, since this is a, a, a set of layers, I can write my own layer and, and put it in the middle. And what I've written is an, is an interest layer that takes every incoming HTTP request and sends the HTTP method and the path to Dynatrace. And I've done this with, um, with the so-called trace interest service. Um, at the trace interest service, so since this is this layer of services, needs to know about, um, about the inner service. This is the only, the only property that I have here. I could do, for example, a timeout service. This is also a service that I can add to it by saying, okay, this request is, al is not allowed to take any longer than three seconds. Then it would, then it would break. It would spit out an, uh, an error code, HTTP error code or something. Then I would wrap my trace interest. Then I would wrap my timeout service within my trace interest service. And I would wrap my trace interest service within the HTTP service, um, et cetera. So it's, it's a layer cake. Um, this, this one tower of layers uh, in your code, it becomes um, a service wrapped in a service, wrapped in a service, wrapped in a service, wrapped in a service. And it goes the entire way through this onion, does something, and it goes out again. Um, this is a constructor function. This is just convention. And this is the implementation of this tower service trait for trace interest. So this is, you can think of that like, like an interface, for example. Uh, in, in Java, you would have an interface. And by implementing the service interface, you make it compatible to everything that needs a service interface. Um, Traits is a little bit more because you're not only able to implement foreign traits for your structs or classes, but you're also able to implement your traits for foreign structs or classes, which is something which is just mind blowing once you realize that you can do with it. And there's lots of great, great use cases for it. Um, and um, what I'm doing here is, uh, um, so this is all type system foo, and this is 
ridiculously complicated. If this is the first time that you're seeing Rascals, you are wondering why, why do you want to have stuff like that? This is just overwhelming. It doesn't make sense. There's lots of domain knowledge on top of it that you need to understand. And believe me, it took me, it took me more than a year to get through stuff like that, to, to reach the point where I understood everything that is happening there. But what is actually, but so if I can give you the whole thing in a nutshell, I'm just making um, um, the request compatible to a, a possible response. And since everything works asynchronously, it works with promises or futures. I also need to provide a certain type of future so those things are compatible with each other. That's all it does. Um, again, I could talk hours just on, on those three lines of code. Um, this is not what we are concerned about today. That's why I'm moving on. What's more interesting is this call function. So this is what happens with every service. Uh, at some point in time, it's going to be called. I get um, the request and then I can get from the request based on the headers, I can get the parent context that I need for, uh, for tracing. Um, this is also a function that I just copied from the box. Um, I'm uh, having a header extractor, I'm putting in my request headers, and this is where I get all the information on, hey, uh, what's, what, what trace am I currently on? Uh, uh, is this something I can add to it? Or is this something that I can, uh, or do I have to create a new one, et cetera? So, so Dynatrace, or, or in, in general, if, if you're working with open telemetry, lots of meta information is stored in, in, in the headers, which is picked up by all the services um, and, and by, by everything that you write, and you can build upon it and add new spans to it. Um, one thing that's great with Dynatrace is that, for example, if you still use our one agent, uh, which makes sense, for example, in the Spring application, um, the Dynatrace one agent starts with the right header information, so you can pick up in your um, in your Rust application on the same header information. So this makes the one agent compatible with what what we're doing in Open Telemetry. Um, one example that we have. Um, 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 here at Dynatrace, so we're using Rust uh, in production already for a couple of selected services that we are running, where it makes sense to use Rust, but we still have um, an, a spring-based proxy in front of it, which does direction to other services, typically microservice architecture. You get in at this one proxy layer, and then you select which service that you are, that you are uh, uh, calling. Um, and here runs the one agent, it starts the traces, and our Rust code becomes compatible with it isn't a pure path just because we are relying on the same headers. Okay, I get the parent context. I start a new span. I call it rec because it's for every request that I do. And then I get from uh, the request object, I get the method and I get the path. So HTTP method is, an, um, is, is a metric that is understood by OTEL, which is why I've selected it. I'm sure there's one for path, I couldn't find it, but I just select the path because this is, this is how I think and this is what I'm looking for. So I can, I can add my own Dynatrace is going to, to tell me that there are some metrics that they don't know about yet. And I can add it to, to my monitored metrics. We are going to see that in just a second. So that's the code setup. Um, this is the service. I've implemented a little bit of, of a boilerplate code to have it available as a layer. So I can use the same service here in dot layer. Trace interest layer new. That's what it does. And again, I said I could also do, for example, at there we are timeout layer new, and then I would have a timeout duration. Um, boom, boom, boom. I need to. Sorry, this is this is live coding. Uh, the, from milliseconds, from 1,000 milliseconds. So I could say you're not allowed to go any longer than 1,000 milliseconds. But hey, um, those requests take a couple of microseconds. So I'm good with that. I don't need a timeout layer here. Alrighty. So that's that. Um, once I'm done, I use Cargo. Cargo is a build tool, package manager tool for us. It's one of the best tooling experiences that I ever had because um, every project feels the same, every project works the same. You're able to download and check out any Rust project that is and you're able to run it because of all the nice conventions there. Uh, I built um, a release version. This takes a little bit of time. So some warnings because I have some inputs that I didn't use. Um, so one disclaimer since, um, since Rust is natively compiled, it has a very rich syntax. It does a lot of stuff 
at compile time and update runtime, compiling takes a lot of time, especially if you have a lot of dependencies. So be aware that um, um, Rust is not something for people in a hurry. Uh, you are you're maybe battling the compiler a lot because it has some way of thinking about things, uh, which might not be your way of thinking things. And only if you two align, uh, you are able to compile it, that this compilation process can take a lot of time. Um, but yeah, what you're getting is an optimized binary that's basically as fast as C or C++ code. That's mainly optimized. So I, I take that anytime. And I run uh, my server. Uh, there it is. It listens to localhost. And if I jump into another um, into another um, um, window, I can curl uh, localhost at port 3000, and I get my, my Hello World HTML. So this is, uh, I think, even with the right header information. So um, let's do some, no, let's do this, the fun stuff later on. Uh, let me show it how it looks like in Dynatrix. And, and sorry, so I'm, I just confronted you with a wall of text and a wall of information. Do, before I'm switching to the browser, do you have any question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I learned more about Rust than I ever, ever wanted to learn. <laughs> For me, you're completely right. It feels um, very new and different. Um, I think the, the, what, what we wanted to achieve today is figuring out how Rust developers can use open telemetry. So let's jump to open telemetry and actually see what's, what's been uh, captured. That will be very interesting. Love to. So um, a couple of things that I needed to do to get the whole thing started. So in, in this is the Dynatrace, right? I mean, the setting screen right now, this is a totally fresh tenant. So I just created one for this demo today um, to, to, to make sure that I have, have a blank slate so I'm not confused with any, anything else around. So um, one thing that I need to activate is the send W3C trace constant context HTTP headers. Um, this is in the settings, uh, server side monitoring, deep monitoring tab. Um, this is also something that I just took from the documentation and it worked like the charm. And the nice thing is um, this, was, this was switched on by default right now. So I, I think this is something that uh, um, uh, will have some, some future. Um, uh, and we are relying on, on, on having this trace context HTTP headers. This is nice. Um, and, and once I activated that, I'm going to see my distributed traces in the distributed traces tab. And um, let's look at the time. So this is the one that just happened uh, uh, two minutes ago. That's Rick. That's the one span that I just said. It took 12 microseconds to execute. It's from the Rust Quick Start service. This is the one, one name that I said uh, earlier. And if I jump into it, I get uh, um, this one trace. I didn't do any, anything else. In particular, and I see the HTTP method and the path, the two things that I'm that I was um, that I was sending. So I have them here, so I know which stuff has taken a lot of time. Um, and now let's do something fun um, to to see how how cool it actually is to to work with the thing. Um, so this was just one request. Let's send um, um, a thousand requests mm -hmm. in batches of one hundred uh, to localhost. Uh, 3000. There you go. I guess this is the right syntax. I'm always confusing it because curl and uh, the Apache benchmark have a different way of handling URLs for some reason. Uh, but zip. So those were a thousand requests. <laughs> and, and the longest request took nine milliseconds. But but I'm, I'm interested in actually how long took it to, to prepare the response because this, this, this is the layer where I, I hooked myself into. Um, and uh, it's also so all those thousand requests. It, I, I was I was amazed by um, how how fast it was here in the distributed traces tab, because uh, where are they? There we go. So um, those are already the new traces. There you go. And it just took a couple of microseconds in within Rust to execute the thing. The rest would be with all the network traffic, etc. So this is just what what my Rust application um, was able to to produce. Uh, um, uh, during that time, uh, it, it's it's that fast, and this is this is why we want to have something like Rust. We want to have that speed. We want to have that native-like speed. Um, this is why Rust is being used in the cloud-native space for all the things like um, uh, service meshes, etc. So this is this is where you get. Um, well, Stefan, these are all very simple requests, all right? It's great that we have the, the traces for every single request, but how about a little more complex ones? 
Um, you mean um, um, what if I need to need to um, um, uh, fetch some data in between and stuff like that? For instance, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, make, so, or making calls to external services or stuff like yeah. that. Does this yeah. also work? Yeah, sure. So, so uh, this is the Hello World, and and you, you know that uh, it's it's a lot of code to just show you the very basics. But um, what what would happen if if I would have to call different services and need to wait uh, between stuff that happens. I didn't prepare anything of that, but um, I just modified this root function into something that can pick up on the request again. Mm -hmm. So at this particular point, I can again uh, get a parent context by using the get parent context uh, method, percent rec. And from that on, I can um, um, continue adding spans. To it mm -hmm. to the same trace. Mm -hmm. So I would say, okay, this is this is uh, I'm starting the context uh, uh, context. Maybe I'm not just print lining um, this 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 path here, but maybe I create something from the span. Then I say start uh, um, uh, database request mm -hmm. and database request mm -hmm. um, modify uh, database request to data structure because there's some needs is some mapping logic. Maybe that's very expensive. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then convert it to the response and send the response. So I was, I'm able in, within this function to just add a couple of spans, set a couple of attributes, and then I would have uh, a, a full trace with all the spans. Mm -hmm. So this is possible. And also, another, if you would make a call yeah. to a, another backend service, you mentioned Java and Spring earlier, if you would make a call to a Spring service that is instrumented as well with open telemetry or with the one agent, you would get the end-to-end -end yeah. trace. Exactly. I just need to make sure that, I, that I'm sending the headers along. So since I'm here at the very low level, um, 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 programming language. At the moment, I'm creating um, uh, a request on my own. I need to make sure that those headers are attached mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's a good point to jump into the documentation because I can mm -hmm. then show you which which stuff is also possible yeah. uh, uh, by doing the open open telemetry thing. Let me switch back to um, to the browser. So one thing that we spoke about is um, maybe having an outgoing request to some other service or some database or whatnot. Um, this is the instrument trust application with open telemetry blog post uh, or, or help content, which is uh, fantastic. So this is everything that I want to have from um, from uh, a documentation because it just works. This is all the setup. It explains what there's need to do. Um, the whole uh, uh, parent context thing. But here we have an outgoing request. Um, and here you see I'm going to um, uh, create the hyper request. So this is. Within my code, I'm within one, one execution. I need to make a request to some other service. Mm -hmm. So I'm creating a request to some URL. As you see, I started, um, I'm, I'm, um, uh, I'm within the current context uh, with the one span that I have mm -hmm. up here um, and uh, creating this request. And here I have this header and check the stuff that takes the request headers from the one request that I'm about to send and ingests all the necessary open telemetry headers so it can be picked up by the next service. Mm -hmm. And this is everything there's to do to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I would have to execute the request, wait for the data, and then I can continue working with new spans, new attributes, whatsoever. So this is one thing. And this is, you know, this is monitoring on a level where, where I as an application developer get a lot out of it. But there's even more to it. So one thing that uh, that my colleagues at Dynatrace did, uh, mainly Philip Kiras, who who did some fantastic work in creating um, a Dynatrace exporter with the Open Telemetry repo, uh, the official Open tele Telemetry repo, so you can install Open tele Telemetry underscore Dynatrace. That's a tongue twister. Mm -hmm. As a create, um, and have just a little bit of of instruction code to get it started instead of of doing the whole thing, even with your uh, um, tenants and IDs and, uh, and whatnot, um, and then you can then you can listen to stuff from the actual task execution. So if you're interested in how your your small uh, units of tasks that are executed asynchronously behave, you can directly monitor those with just this one line of code. That's everything. This so um, this is interesting for folks who uh, develop applications, but who are also interested in if the way the application affects in some way, in some way the, um, the, the asynchronous runtime underneath it. And 
um, since I'm creating a lot of system software within Rust, this is stuff that I'm very much interested about. Yeah. Uh, is my orchestration of tasks in the asynchronous runtime in some way faulty? Uh, since you have everything in your own hands, there's a lot that can go wrong. <laughs> um, um, and this is stuff I'm interested about. And this is everything that, there's, that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So I'm super happy with this one. This is the kitchen sink full configuration. And you know, it, look at that. It, it, fits on, it fits on one screen. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. I'm, I'm super happy um, that, that uh, this exists. Um, and, you know, um, this is stuff, since, since Tokyo is an asynchronous runtime, you are not limited to gRPC servers or HTTP servers. Um, for example, if you run AWS Lambda, um, it builds on Tokyo if you're writing a Rust Lambda. And you get a speed up from 10 to 20x if you're writing it in Rust as compared to any other language. So mm -hmm. I have a whole talk on, on, on serverless Rust. Um, which where, where I made performance comparisons and how those serverless providers like Azure Functions or AWS Lambda work under the hood and how Rust can help you getting better Lambda, so better Azure Functions. Um, I don't know if, you, if you're maintaining a, li a, a link list at the end, but this is something yes, that- Yes, we, we will add all these links to the, uh, the YouTube video, exactly. Yeah. And I think you know, just uh, made yourself very interesting for a podcast episode <laughs> where we should talk about performance optimization in serverless using Rust. Oh, oh, yes, we, oh yes, we should. Um, please, let's do that. So it's, um, um, you know, everybody says, let's write a serverless application, but um, I never found the field as nuanced at serverless. <laughs> Uh, and um, and I'm happy happy to talk about that. Yeah. So yeah, uh, that's that's the nutshell, I guess. So yeah. again, a lot of things. Don't worry if there was too much code that that um, is hard to read because I understand um, if you are into type system magic, if you're writing advanced application, um, Rust can be very overwhelming. Um, and um, this is this is already very advanced stuff. Um, I'm blogging about the entire thing uh, on my personal blog, so. Uh, if you want to write network applications with Tokyo and Rust, there's a, uh, I guess it's 120 slides. Yeah, almost mm -hmm. a slide deck that you can browse through where I, I explain asynchronous runtimes, Tower, Tokyo, Hyper from, from the ground up um, with a lot of uh, resources, examples that you can check videos. Um, and and if, if I have a public presentation where there's a video, I'm also going to link it here. Mm -hmm. um, same for, for serverless Rust. So I have, I guess, I guess it's a 60 slide deck or no, it's just 40. Maybe it's missing an update. Um, same thing with all the example code mm -hmm. um, and videos for recordings of all that. So um, if you're interested in Rust, cloud native, serverless and Otel, I have lots of resources for that on my blog. And then more than happy to chat about that. Perfect. And I'm really jealous that you got oeta.dev as a domain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, it just redirects to headflow right yeah. now, but maybe have something in uh, up with it. I don't know. Yeah. I just wanted to grab yeah. one nice dev domain before everybody else does, and all the cool ones were already taken. So yeah. I said, hey, oeta. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, okay, that's what I registered. <laughs> hey, I just want to recap a couple of things for me mm -hmm. that is new to Rust. So basically what you've shown is that um, Rust is one of these runtimes, even though it's been around for a while, it's really taking off in cloud native, especially around serverless and the way observability vendors like Dynatrace and also others can keep up with all of this change. We're obviously all betting on open telemetry. This is great. That means we can instrument your app with open telemetry. Um, and now one of the things that I want to also clarify the way you did it, you used the direct exporter from your app to Dynatrace. I think there's other ways around it. Obviously, you can also send open telemetry data to an open tel collector, yep. and then the collector is then distributing it. So I think there's depending on best practices and how you want to do it. But in the end, it's all based on open telemetry, the protocol, and uh, you get your distributed traces. On the traces, you can have your spans, your additional metrics, your additional metadata. They're called attributes. Um, so that basically means if you know your app and if you know what you want in your traces for you're monitoring your metrics and also for troubleshooting, then you can put it in there. And then you can use tools like Dynatrace or also Jaeger, Zipcam, and there's so many other tools out there obviously yeah. in the space, but you've shown it today with Dynatrace and I'm very happy for that. Exactly. Um, and, and there's one, one very important point. Um, so, so that's the perfect wrap up. And there's one, one important point um, that, you, that you just mentioned, um, I'm in control for doing that. So, so I can pick what's right for my application. And, um, I guess we are at the point where we know that no size fits all. 
mm. uh, and um, and that we need to rely on custom solutions. This is this is why I've chosen Rust to begin with. I wanted to have something that was not able uh, uh, that I was not able to do with any other technology. This was something that was very custom to our needs. And this is also why I want to have monitoring accustomed to my needs. And this is why I love this protocol. And this is why I love work, working with open tailing mm -hmm. And you know, getting all the nice connections within the rest of the mm -hmm. I consider that a benefit. I think so too. Thank you so much. <laughs> Stefan, I'm pretty sure, I hope this was not the first and last uh, where we talk about Rust and other technologies that you are playing with. So I will definitely follow up with the invitation to the podcast and then we'll do nice. more on this because this is great educational. Thank you so much. It's fun. Great. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. See ya.